Good morning, everyone. Turn your Bible with me this morning, if you would, to the Gospel of Matthew once again. Matthew chapter 9, we'll begin reading in verse 27. Matthew chapter 9 in verse 27. Now, Matthew is continuing to record some of the miracles, the healings that Christ performed while he was here upon the earth. And when Jesus departed thence, Two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. Now, this is the first time that Matthew records this saying, Son of David, but it was 
acknowledging that they believed Jesus to be the Messiah because the Messiah was referred to as the son of David. And so they're saying to him, we believe you are the Messiah and we would ask you to have mercy upon us. And when he was coming to the house, the blind man came to him. So he didn't immediately respond to them, did he? It says, when he came into the house, they came to him, and Jesus said unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this. They said unto him, Yea, Lord, yea. He says, do you believe? You've called me the Messiah. Do you think that I'm able to do what you're asking me to do? And that's to give you your sight back. And they says, Yeah, Lord, we believe you can. Now, we don't know anything about the background, how much they had heard, how much they had been told about Jesus. I'm convinced that they had heard, hey, there's someone that can heal you. We've seen it happen. We've seen it occur. We know none of those details. But anyway, they come to him in faith, and you've got to admire their persistence. They didn't just give up and quit. They kept coming, didn't they, until they finally got Jesus to acknowledge them. And he says, are you believing? Do you believe I can do what you're asking me to do? When you ask God to do things, and you're praying for God to do things, do you really believe that he is able to do what you're asking him to do in faith? Faith's important. Without it, it's impossible to please God. And we know what these two blind men didn't know because the scriptures hadn't been written yet, that God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we're even able to ask or think, isn't he? So there, is there anything too hard for God? Is there anything that God can't do? God can do all things, can he? And he's saying to him, do you believe I can do this? Yea, Lord, we believe. And here's the thing about it. We can utter and speak the words, but God knows within our heart whether or not we really believe he can do it or not, doesn't he? He does, doesn't he? And so we see here how Jesus responds to them. Then touched he their eyes and saying, according to your faith, be it unto you. Christ knew they believed that he could do what they were asking him to do. And he healed them at this particular time. Restored their sight unto him. And then we go on down and their eyes were open and Jesus straightly charged them saying, see that no man know it. But they, when they were departed, spread and brought his fame in all that country. Now, why would Jesus say to these two men that he was just healed, don't tell anybody about it. You know, when we're saved, we're to do what? Go proclaim it to the world, aren't we? Confess it, what the Bible says. So why would he in this particular situation say, don't tell anybody? Now, I have read and I have studied and I've heard other people's opinions and that's what it is, is an opinion as to why Jesus would tell these people not to tell anybody. I don't know. I can think, I can speculate. Maybe he didn't want to be just known as a miracle worker. I don't know why he told them not to tell anybody, but he said, don't you say anything about it. But having this done unto them, naturally, what are they going to do? They went about telling people, didn't they, what had happened. So as to why he told them this, we can speculate. We can have our own opinions and such. As, but we really don't know, do we? You don't. You, you can't say for certain why Jesus told them, look, don't tell anybody. But here's the thing about it. Whatever God does, there's a reason and there's a purpose in it. Isn't there? <coughs> and I believe that. And that's all I need to understand and to believe. Now, we move on down, continue reading. And so they went out. Behold, they brought to him a dumb man possessed with the devil. And this guy couldn't even speak. So they brought him someone who was demon-possessed, who was unable at this time to speak. And when the devil was cast out, Jesus cast the devil out. The dumb spake, and the multitudes marveled, saying, he has never, It was never so seen in Israel. So here they, 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 they watched. They saw for themselves two miracles. Blind men receiving their sign, and someone who couldn't speak, given the ability to speak once again. And they marveled, didn't they? See, we've never seen this happen before. This has never occurred before because it hasn't. Because the Messiah has come back. And these are all prophecies concerning what the Messiah was going to do. So he's providing for them evidence 
But he is who he says he is, the Son of God who has come to what? Die for the sins of the world. And so these miracles that Christ is performing are backing up the claims that he is making. And we don't know exactly how many people Jesus healed while he was here upon the earth. John tells us if they had been recorded and written down, the world itself couldn't contain the volumes that could have been written about him. So he's provided for them all kinds of evidence, all kinds of proof that I, hey, look, I am the Son of God. I do have the power to forgive sins. I am going to die on the cross and pay sins dead. You look at these two blind men and you think about their situation. Physically blind, unable to see, wanting their eyes open to what they could see. Now, you compare this to man's condition spiritually. Every, you know, she sang Amazing Grace. I once was blind, but now I see everybody is spiritually blind. Everyone is spiritually dead, separated from God. We're born sinners. We're spiritually blind. We need to have our eyes open. And only Jesus can do that, can he? Give us eternal life. Give us spiritual sight, so to speak. And he is able to do just that, isn't he? And how does he do that? How do you do? He said, according to your faith, he healed them, didn't he? How has God chosen to impart to us eternal life? Now, eternal life... You're, you're saved by grace, and that's unmerited favor. But God has chosen your faith as the means, the avenue whereby he imparts that grace to you. We're saved by what? Grace through faith. So you see, to be healed spiritually, which is far more important than being healed if you were blind physically. I'm not, I'm not trying to, uh, you know, to belittle that or think that, you know, that's not a big deal. Yes, that was a great big deal. If you couldn't see and you were able to see, that's a very big deal for you, isn't it? But what I'm saying is this. Spiritual well-being is far more important than physical well-being. And we're all <coughs> spiritually dead blind. But you say, there's a remedy there's a cure for that. And that's the blood of Jesus. And to understand and to comprehend that when he died on Calvary's cross, he was doing what you couldn't or I couldn't, no one else could do, satisfy God's demands concerning the punishment of sin, which is death. His death did that. And if we we'll accept that through faith and believe and trust in that, God will do for us Spiritually, what he did for these blind men physically enable you to see, spiritually speaking, to give you eternal life. And we look at the next one, and we see in verse 34, but the Pharisees said he cast us out devils through the prince of the devils. Now we'll talk more about that in another scripture when it goes into more detail. I think it's in chapter 12 concerning the conversation Christ had with them when these accusations were made. Well, you're doing it through the power of Satan. That's how you're able to do this. But this was us. You know what this originated from? Jealousy and envy. He was doing something that they couldn't do. See, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders, they wanted attention. They desired attention. They craved attention from the people. They craved recognition and acknowledgement and praise from them. Well, here's Jesus doing what they couldn't do. And now people are just swarming to him, praising him. And they were jealous. They were jealous. Instead of acknowledging something good had been done, they said, well, I know why. He's just doing it through the power of Satan, trying to discredit him. They tried to discredit him his entire ministry. Why? Because they were jealous of him. They hated him. But as I said, We'll talk about that in more detail when Christ, you know, engages them in conversation about the logic and what they're saying. You know, now think about what you're saying. It doesn't even make sense. Why would Satan fight against Satan? We'll talk about that later. But this morning, let's get to the one scripture I really want to look at and speak about and address. It's verses 35 through 38. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, 
teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. They had case upon case, proof upon proof that he was who he said he was, the Son of God. There was no denying that. Couldn't deny that. This wasn't stage. This wasn't fake. This was real. And when he saw the multitudes, all the people, Bible says he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as having sheep, a sheep having no shepherd. You know, the world is no different today from that standpoint than it was back then. Yes, we live in a different time, different things about our life than what theirs was. Technology has, you know, made our lives so much different than what those people and how they lived back then. But man himself, man himself, when you look at him, it doesn't matter what period of time you look at him at, he has remained the same. His nature hasn't changed. He still has a sinful nature. He isn't any more intelligent than he ever has been. Man just hasn't changed. He's still the same. And today, just like it was in Christ's time, multitudes of people out there now, sheep without a shepherd wander aimlessly, don't they? Without purpose, without reason, is what he's saying. And that reminded Christ of what would take place if you took the shepherd away from the sheep. They have no purpose. They have no, they have no one to, to, to lead them, to guide them, to provide them, to take care of them. And you look at the world today and all the people in it, and they just seem like they're just aimlessly going through life, aren't they? Without really any purpose in life. He, anything they're trying to accomplish in life, other than what would bring man's praise and recognition and acknowledgement to them. You think about that. It's all motivated most of it by what selfish reasons to gain man's praise and such like that. But as far as, you know, you look at people today, same thing you see, isn't it? People just, you know, running here and there, to and fro, going here, going there, doing this, you know, without even considering or thinking about, you know, what's my life really all about? What, 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 what is, what's the purpose of life? What's the reasoning for it? I mean, we're only here for what? Seven, what's life expect you? 78, 87? I don't know what it is now. Probably might be 80 even now. I don't know. You know, and then what? Then what? No wonder Paul made the statement. And he was writing to believers when he made the statement. If all you have in this life is hope in this life, you're a miserable individual. You're miserable. You think you're happy? Satan has deceived you into thinking you're happy. How can you be happy knowing that how it's all going to end? How does this life end? Is it good? No. <laughs> no. No. But you say, this life is going to end. Then what? Then what? Then you'll either enter into God's presence through the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be with Jesus, or you'll do what? Lift up your eyes in hell. You don't go to a holding area, a containment area, and wait. No. The Bible teaches the moment you die, the instant you die, you're either the Lord's and you'll be with Him or you're going to go to hell and spend your eternity in hell. That's what happens. That's what takes place. But how many people today in this world don't want to think about it, don't want to talk about it, don't want you mention it to them? Leave me alone. Sheep without a shepherd. Same way in his day. And he looked at them and he was moved with compassion, thinking if these people just knew, if they just understood, they need to be told. They need to have their eyes open like I healed the blind man, spiritually speaking, to where they can see and understand. He was moved with compassion. And you look at the world we live in today, at the people in the world, their ideas. And their thought processes 
and the way they choose to live their life. It's sad. It, it's really sad. It should sadden us as Christians to see people like this knowing that they're what? Headed toward the devil's hell a lake of fire. And they don't seem like they care. They seem so uninterested, so unconcerned. But you see, we should be like Jesus. We should be concerned for them. And so he prays this prayer, he says, or he says this, he says, Then saith he unto his shepherds, his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Very few people, what he's saying is, are willing to tell these people what they need to hear. Not what they want to hear, but tell them what they need to hear. Very few are willing to do that. Same thing in the day and time we live in today, isn't it? It's just so much easier to get along with the world if you tell them what they want to hear. Don't rock the boat, so to speak. Don't make a stand upon what the Word of God teaches. Just go ahead and, uh, you know, cater to them. Go ahead and, and you, you know, just... just, just Baby them, so to speak. Don't try to offend people. Don't, don't try to hurt nobody's feelings. I'm going to tell you, my friend, people's feelings needs to be hurt. People need to be offended. The Word of God does offend, doesn't it? It's offensive to the carnal, sinful nature. It reveals the sinfulness of man. It tells him he needs to be told this. There's very few people willing to do it, though, are there? It's just easier to just walk. Say, what? Let them go. Who cares? Can't do anything about it. Doesn't matter. Just, just get along with them. No, what the Lord needs is what he needed back then, what he needs right now. People willing to tell the truth. People willing to live the truth and stand upon the truth. No matter how unpopular it becomes. It's going to become more unpopular. It's already becoming unpopular. A big push. Big push. When we enter into this, I don't know when it really all began. And I listen, I'm not for one to set out to purposely hurt people's feelings and talk about people. I, I don't, but you know, you call it like it is. You just do. Political correctness, I mean, when did political correctness become more important than the truth? It isn't. The truth's what matters, isn't it? Well, there's very, many, very few people today that'll tell the truth on it and just tell it like it is. No, we don't want to offend nobody. Don't want to hurt nobody's feelings. Well, I'm going to tell you, people's feelings need to be hurt. People need to be offended. They need to be told the truth. From the Word of God. There's only one way to be saved. Let me begin by saying that. There's only one way to be saved, and that's through Jesus. That's it, period. We're not discussing any other means, any other ways. The Bible. If you believe the Bible, I believe the Bible. He said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No one, no one can come to the Father except through me. I believe that. And that's what people need to be told. Now, are people going to like me for saying that? No. Now, you that love the Lord, you're like, you, you will amen me. But I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of people today, they don't want to hear that. They don't want to be told that. That's hate speech bigotry or they'll call it something. <laughs> but when, I'm, when, when I say that, that's, that's how most of the world would view me as a bigot. Or say I tell them the only way you can be safe through Jesus Christ. That is the only way you can be safe through Jesus Christ. And there's a standard of moral conduct for Christians too. But there's, uh, there, there are, we're, we're to be a peculiar people. different people. We're not to act like the rest of the world. We're not to behave like the rest of the world. What's wrong with that? That's the truth, isn't it? That's the truth. See, that's the thing. Not enough people today willing to tell the truth because of the repercussions for telling the truth. That's just what it is. And next week, we'll get into what Christ tells them when he does send them out, what they're going to be facing when they get out there and how, how people are going to respond to them, how people are going to treat them. He says, so pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. He's saying, look, more people need to step up and be willing to
tell the truth and to live the truth. It's just that simple. It's just that simple. That's what the world needs. The world doesn't need more compromise. The world needs the truth. And here's the thing about the truth. The truth will set you free, but also the truth is divisive. It divides. It reveals what people really stand for, doesn't it? Some people, you don't know what they stand for. They'll tell you what you want to hear. I mean, they do. You're not doing people any favors by doing that. You tell them what they need to hear. <laughs> and how they respond to it, that's between them and the Lord. But what Jesus is saying right here, we need, he says, we need, he needed then, and he needs now. People who do what? They'll tell the truth. Just go out there and just say, look, this is the truth. I love you, and this is why I'm telling you this. You may not think I love you. You may not interpret it as love. You may interpret it as something else. But the fact of the matter is, if you withhold the truth and you don't warn people, how can you say that you love them? They've got to be, they've got to be taught. If you leave this life not knowing Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you're going to hell. That's what the Bible says. That's not some old redneck, hillbilly, bigoted preacher that they would call me his opinion. It is my opinion because I believe it to be the truth, but that's what the Word of God says. That's what he says. If you don't know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, when you die, you're going to hell. That's the truth. That's the way it is. We need more people that live and tell the truth. That's what this world needs. And it's going to become discouraging. You're in a very small minority. Don't think that you are because you are. There's going to be more people dislike you than they are like you because you're telling the truth. But you've got to decide whether or not you're willing to stand upon the truth and be willing to accept the consequences of it. And I think that's why many people choose to remain silent because there's consequences when you boldly proclaim the truth, isn't there? I mean, there just is. Consequences to that. And how people see you, how they view you, how they treat you. But as Jesus says, need more laborers. More of the faithful ones that will say, look, this is just the truth. Period. Pray ye therefore that the Lord of the harvest send forth more of laborers into the harvest. Now here's the thing about it. Let's look at our situation. Now Jesus is sending them to the, as we're going to see next week, talk about it, into the, just to the Jewish people to begin with. He said, look, don't you go to the Gentiles, don't go to the Samaritans, just go to the Jewish people. And you tell them, and you preach to them, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, theirs is comparable to our situation because he's sent them to the people who had a knowledge of God's word. They had, they had a knowledge of God's word. Now, the Gentiles, the Samaritans did. But that would, it would go to them like, he said, you go talk to them, you go tell them. And he talks about the responses they're going to get. We'll talk more about that in the weeks to come, how people responded to them and, what he, and how he said to respond to their response. The task that we have today in the United States of America is a nation that has for years been saturated with the gospel. I mean, it has been. You'd have to be hiding under a rock to not have heard about it. You just, you'd have to run from it. We talked about the Sunday school class this morning. You'd have to practically hide from it because there's Bibles everywhere. There's churches everywhere. It's on the airways, radio, television. If you want to hear the truth, my friend, it's there for you to hear. It's there for you to hear. And it's more difficult to go out and to speak to people in our country than it would be to go to a country where they've never heard the truth, who would readily accept the truth. Look at the scriptures. 
the Jewish people, there were some converts, there were some people who believed, but what happened once that message went to the Gentiles? Man, alive, there were so many more Gentile believers than there were Jewish believers, weren't there? There was. Much better response. <coughs> it's tough. It's hard sometimes with what we have become as a nation because we've literally been on the road to abandoning God for a long time now. Just a little bit of time, a little bit of time, and we've gotten to the point where we are right now. And there's so many people, they don't want you to talk to them about God. They'll do that on their own, or they'll, uh, you know, when they're ready. And it makes it difficult. It does. It's not an easy task. You know, if it was easy, wouldn't it, people would do it more, wouldn't they? It's a hard task. It's a tough task. But it's one that must be done. And I appreciate you, each and every one of you, for your faithfulness and your commitment to the Lord. And we need to stay faithful and committed to the Lord and to the truth during the times that we live in. It's not going to get easier. It's going to get more difficult. Because you need to understand something. We're living in the last days. We're closer today than we were. We're closer now to Christ's return than we were yesterday. We understand that. We know that. And the Bible teaches and clearly that things get progressively worse toward those times, doesn't it? When uh, Paul wrote his letters to Timothy, how did he describe it? When he wrote his letters to Romans, how did he describe it? Go back and read it. What things are going to be like the times we're living in right now? It's not going to be that easy of a task, but it's a necessary task. It's one that God's people have been given throughout all of history. And you think sometimes ours is tough. Think about Jeremiah and Isaiah when they were sent to preach before God allowed them to be taken into captive. You think when we do have a very unpopular message, how would you like to go preach their message? They had to preach to a people who didn't believe and who didn't want to hear that. You're going into captivity. No, we're not going into captivity. These people tell her, how unpopular were they? Think about it. But yet it was necessary, wasn't it? It's still necessary today. So what we need to do is to uplift one another, support one another, stand upon the truth, and tell people the truth. That's what God would have us to do. That's what God wants us to do. Now, as I said, we'll talk in the weeks to come about the responses you're going to receive from it, just similar to what they received. Rejection, persecution, trying to be silenced, and that goes along with it. It's part of it. But listen, here's the thing. I'm going to stand before God one day, not before anybody else. I'm going to stand before God one day and I'm going to have to answer to Him. Did I speak the truth? Did I live the truth? Did I stand for the truth? If there's ever been a time the church needs to, that time is now. Because there's so much pressure for us to yield and to compromise to the world that we're in today. Don't do it. Don't do it. Stay with the truth. And if you're here this morning, if you're listening to this, some of them maybe listen to this later or broadcasting. The truth is, God does love you and I love you. I love you. If I didn't love you, I wouldn't be telling you the truth. You need Jesus. If you're lost, you need Jesus. He's your only hope. He is the only way. You need Jesus. And the thing about it is this. It doesn't cost you nothing. All you've got to do is realize that you, yes, are a sinner. That you're lost. That you're headed for a devil's hell. That Jesus died for you. If you'll trust him, he'll give you eternal life. Now that's the truth, my friend. 
according to the word of God. Jesus loves you, will, and wants to save you. Let's bow for the word of prayer. Father, we come to you this morning thanking you and praising you again, God, for the opportunity we have, Lord, to stand and to tell the truth, to preach the truth. God, it's all about your son, Jesus. <coughs> Not about us, it's about what he did at Calvary in dying for our sins, God, and providing for us a means of salvation if we'll accept it and believe in it. God, and I praise you for that this morning. God, I praise you for each one here today. I pray to receive the blessing, God. And I pray this message will go, God. And I know it's not going to return void. The Lord is going to accomplish what you've sent it out to do. And Lord, if anyone hears this today, listens to this today, and doesn't know Christ as a personal Savior, God, help them to come to the knowledge of the truth and put their faith and trust in Him. In His name we pray. Amen. Stand this time. We sing a song of invitation. Page 385. Before we dismiss, anybody? Anyone? Remember, we have our business meeting tonight. Dickie's meeting this morning right after church. Any other? Anybody else? All right. Bless you. Good to see you. Doris dismisses. Pretty too. Come on here, pretty June. <laughs>